You're listening to an encore presentation of Bible Answers Live. However, if you want to order any materials offered during tonight's program, you may call our resource number anytime at 800 835 6747. Welcome to Bible Answers Live, where you'll get honest answers to your Bible questions. Let's face it, it's not always easy to understand everything you read in the Bible. With 66 books and more than 700,000 words, the Bible can generate a lot of questions. If you'd like answers to your Bible questions, you've come to the right place. Now, here's your host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, President and Speaker of Amazing Facts. Hello friends, would you like to hear an amazing fact? The world is facing a sand shortage. I'll bet those are some words you probably never thought you'd hear. It's true. More than iron, coal, or timber, sand has now become the world's most widely consumed natural resource after fresh water. Most houses, skyscrapers, and bridges are made with concrete, which is, of course, two-thirds sand. The annual world consumption of sand is estimated to be 15 billion tons, and China's demand for sand has increased exponentially by 437% over the last 20 years. Sand, once widely considered to be limitless, is now emerging as a threatened resource. You might be thinking, the world is covered by deserts and filled with sand. But the round grains of sand found in the desert do not bind well so they can't be used for most concentrated purposes or most construction purposes. For example, Dubai, which is surrounded by desert sand, has used up all of its quality marine sand. Now Dubai must import sand from Australia to maintain its ongoing building frenzy. High quality sand, or more precisely silicon, is needed to produce computer chips and microprocessors and many other products. Most glass makers use only fine white silica sand. Some geologists estimate that the world only has about a 20-year supply remaining of the fine silica sand. Did you know the Bible says that there are several promises and prophecies related to sand? Stay with us, friends. We're going to learn more on this edition of Bible Answers Live. You're listening to Bible Answers Live, honest answers to your Bible questions. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this evening's program, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, let's join our host, Pastor Doug Batchelor, and our co-host, Pastor Jean Ross. Hello, listening friends. This is Bible Answers Live, and if you have a Bible question, we'd invite you to give us a call. It's a free phone call. We have lines open, and that number is 800-463-7297. One more time, that's 800-GOD-SAYS if you'd like to call in with your Bible question. And my name is Doug Batchelor. My name is Sean Ross. Good evening, friends, and Pastor Doug, it's good to be doing Bible Answers Live again this evening. I know we've had a, a couple of weeks where you were gone or I, will, I was gone, but it's good to be back together. And we also want to greet our Facebook friends who are joining us also live and uh, if you have a Bible question, the phone line here to the studio is uh, 1-800-463-7297. And that'll bring you here with your Bible question. Well, Pastor Doug, before we go to the phone lines, let's start with a word of prayer. Mm-hmm. Dear Father, once again, we are grateful for the opportunity to spend some time opening up your word and studying together. We do ask for the Holy Spirit to come and guide our hearts, our minds, be with those who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Doug, you opened the program talking about sand. And, uh, of course, we take sand for granted. We hear a lot about the deserts that are growing and all of the sand in the deserts. But uh, you brought up a good point that desert sand isn't really that useful, especially when it comes to construction. You need a different kind of sand, which is actually running out. Amazing. Yeah. The sand that comes down from the mountains you find deposited either on the seashore by rivers Uh, That has like rough edges and it bonds well with concrete. Desert sand, because it's been blown by the wind and the uh, water for a long time, it's all rounded. It just, it doesn't work. And you never would think that we could run out of good sand for construction and for windows and for (laughs) these things. But they've actually got in India, they got a sand mafia because the market is so fierce Mm. 
for the sand. And, um, you know, it makes me think about, uh, you think of sand as being something limitless. And many times in the prophecies, God said to Abraham that someday your descendants will be like the sand on the seashore. We often use that expression. And Isaiah 48, 19, it says, your descendants also would have been like the sand and your offspring of your body like the grains of sand. But there's another prophecy in the Bible where it talks about what some believe is concrete. You know, when you look at uh, the image of Daniel chapter 2, the kingdoms of the world are outlined, where it talks about this dream that Nebuchadnezzar had where there's a head of gold, the arms are silver, the belly is bronze, the legs are iron, and the feet are a mixture of iron and it says miry clay, and you'll find that mentioned in Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. Well, I heard uh, a couple of theologians that have postulated the number one building material in the world today is concrete that is reinforced with iron. And if you are an ancient Bible prophet and you are trying to say, what, is, what are they making the buildings out of today? They're not using stone like the Tower of Babel. Um, they use miry clay is what it would look like. There's a gray, mushy substance mixed in with iron. And uh, it's just kind of amazing that it is the number one building material in the world today. And some those kingdoms in Daniel's dream take us down from the time of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the divisions of the Roman Empire, the Ten Toes, to where we're living in the world today. And uh, then you've got the, the two beasts that are mentioned. It's like there's two legs on that and two feet. And you get the, the two beasts that are found in Revelation 13. Uh, many believe that one of those beasts is dealing with Catholicism based in Europe and Rome and Protestantism based in the United States. And we get a lot of questions about prophecy and the United States, don't we? We do. And we have something, if you've had questions about that, then we have a special free offer that we're going to make available tonight. It's one of our Amazing Facts study guides, and it's called the U.S. in Bible Prophecy. And again, it deals with this uh, passage of Scripture that you find in Revelation chapter 13. It's just a very important study, and I think you'll find this very helpful. It's free. All you'll have to do is give us a call and ask for it. Again, the study guide is called the U.S. in Bible Prophecy, and the phone line is 800-835-6747. That is our resource phone line, and uh, just ask for the study guide called the U.S. in Bible Prophecy. Again, that number is 800-835-6747. Well, Pastor Doug, I think we're ready to go to the phone lines. We've got Joseph listening um, in the U.S. Joseph, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, and your question. Um, is there any significance in the 2000th anniversary of... Uh, Jesus' baptism, crucifixion, and the stoning of Stephen. Well, right now, um, Jesus was baptized, as near as we can tell, about 27 A.D. We know that he ministered three and a half years, and he died in 31 A.D. Stephen was stoned about three and a half years after that in 34 A.D. Uh, there's no—we're not commanded to celebrate the anniversary. You mean— it, it, is this some kind of benchmark that would have some prophetic fulfillment that we reach 2,000 years from that event? Yeah, uh, recently, sorry, yeah, uh, we had 500 anniversary of Luther's protest. Right. So similarly, is there any prophetic significance in the 2000, if we say 6,000 years ago, Adam and Eve were created? You know, there's no command that we would know anything about the time of Christ coming. So I don't know of any prophecy that points 2,000 years beyond Jesus' baptism to any event happening. Although it is interesting, you did bring up a, a, a something that has been around for quite a while, and they refer to that as the great week of time mm -hmm. and the significance of seven in the Bible. You find God working for six days in creation, and then he rested on the seventh day. Uh, and some see that as uh, at least a an outline of, of world history where the earth is inhabited for 6,000 years, then Jesus comes and there's the 1,000 year millennial rest, uh, and then the earth is recreated after that. So uh, that is interesting, and I think there's something there, but we don't know for sure when we reach that 6,000 year mark. 
Right. It's all kinds of speculations and ideas out there, but... Uh, We've already actually passed the time of 2,000 years from Christ's birth. Right. We have not passed the time of 2,000 years from his baptism or his death or resurrection. So we've got to be careful about saying what that means, but it does, I do think that we know the time is near because we're in like the sixth millennium, which is like sundown uh, before you have the thousand year, kind of a Sabbath millennium. And uh, we do appreciate your question, Joseph. Do you have, uh, we have a special offer maybe on the second coming that we could uh, make available. We do. We'll be happy to send this to anyone who calls and asks, and it's called Anything But Secret. It's a book dealing with the second coming. To receive that, give us a call on the resource line. That's 800-835-6747. And again, you can ask for the book called Anything But Secret. Our next call is Zane listening from Upland, California. Zane, welcome to the program. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for calling and your question. Um, so I have a friend who uh, is struggling a lot to understand the Bible and God, and I'm trying to help him understand, but I don't have the best answer for this question that he's struggling with, and that's what's the proof for the existence of God? Well, I wish we had about 60 minutes right now because I just preached a sermon, and the title of the sermon is evidence for God, or can you prove that there's a God? Now, you'll find that online, probably on YouTube, or you can for free, but um, I can give you a couple of high points very quickly. Um, one would be that science is more and more coming to the conclusion that because of the complexity of life, and when they look through these super electron microscopes and they look at the formation of matter, that there's so much interworking design and organization that you do not get this kind of intelligent systems that are functioning without an outside intelligence organizing it. So there must be an original outside intelligence to produce all of the intelligent life and the interworking systems and the symbiotic relationships. And, and so that to me, I think is the strongest. The other evidence is there's so many things that happen that seem to be providential that you would just think there has to be a God. I'll give you a small story I thought of this week. I traveled, um, went out of state, left my phone charger. I thought, oh no, what am I gonna do now? I need my phone for everything. I forgot my charger. I prayed about it, got to my hotel room. Imagine my surprise when in the hotel wall, somebody had left a charger that fit my phone. <laughs> of course, I used it and gave it to the hotel desk <laughs> after I charged my phone. But I, I mean, what are the odds of that? You know, so many things like that I could cite that you just know there has to be a God because of providence. And so take a look at that sermon. And I don't know if there's anything specific we can offer on, oh, well, we've got wonders of creation. We also have a book on the Bible. And of course, if uh, people can see that the Bible is trustworthy, then what the Bible says is trustworthy with reference to God. That's right. There's evidence the Bible can be trusted. And the book is called The Ultimate Resource, and it's about the Bible. And uh, it's just a great read and we'll be happy to send it to anyone who calls and asks the number is 800-835-6747 and you can ask for the book called the ultimate resource it's about the bible and of course the bible will give you all the evidences you need for the existence of god what's that number again uh the number one more time is 800-835-6747 and we'll be happy to send it to anyone who calls and asks our next caller that we have is uh, chris listening in chicago chris welcome to the program uh, hi, Pastor uh, Pastor Doug, Pastor John. How are you doing? Um, not too bad. Yourself? Great. We're glad you called in your question. Yeah, geez, this is kind of hard. Um, I'm calling because I wanted to know in Leviticus where Moses wrote down the laws and like what their consequences were, if they still apply today. Well, there. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Because, uh, like, for certain things, it said you were, they were an abomination to the Lord, and and uh, you were just like condemned to death. So, basically, I wanted to know if that still applies. Well, let me ask a different question, uh, Chris. Before I answer your question, you sound like, from the emotion in your voice, that you've broken one of these and you're in trouble. I've broken two of them. 
but I didn't realize what they were till I started reading the Bible. Let me just explain that the big question is, does God forgive? And the Bible tells us all different kinds of sin that God forgives. Now, without going into the specifics of what you may be struggling with, I strongly recommend that um, you just you, you pray when we hang up and ask the Lord to forgive your sins, whatever it is, and believe that the sacrifice of Jesus, that he'll do that because he longs to forgive you and give you a new life. Back to your original question, as far as the law of Moses is concerned, when you read in Deuteronomy, when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, now it's chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is after Numbers and Leviticus. Chapter 4, if you go to verse 13, it says, He declared to you the words, oh, well, let me see, I'm, uh, is this the one I want? Yeah, verse 14, And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them. Before that, he says, He declared his covenant. He commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments. And, he wrote them on two tables of stone, and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments. So Moses explains, not only did God give the Ten Commandments, that's the moral law for all eternity. There were other statutes and judgments, and some of these were ceremonial laws that were nailed to the cross. Some are civil laws, and there are health laws. There are several categories of laws that God gave Moses on the mountain. And, uh, you know, the ceremonial laws are no longer required. The moral laws... It's very clear. But uh, Chris, hey, would you mind if I just prayed with you before we uh, went to the next call and help you to find the, the peace that Jesus offers? Would that be all right? That'd be fine. All right. Father in heaven, I just pray that you'll be with Chris and just bless him with your spirit. I ask, Lord, that you help him to find peace and regardless of the struggles that he's encountered, to believe that Jesus' blood is powerful enough to wash away all sin. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we have a, a book that we can offer, Chris. It's called uh, Three Steps to Heaven, Chris. We'd like to send you a f copy of that book, and uh, please read it. It'll give you some encouragement. The number to call is 800-835-6747. And again, just ask for the book called Three Steps to Heaven. That number is 800-835-6747. And the book, Three Steps to Heaven. We have uh, Julian, who's listening in Minnesota. Julian, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you for your call. Oh, hi there. Um, yes, good evening, Pastor Ross and Pastor um, um, Doug. Um, I have a question about, um, this came up in our study, the Sabbath, you know, for um, lesson number nine. And it says, how might we discern whether or not to quote from Scripture when attempting to witness to people similar to those of Athens, when Paul went to Athens on his second journey. Yes. And, um, yeah, and he was witnessing to the pagans, and he didn't use much scripture. So can you explain that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're, you know, of course you quote scripture to people that recognize the validity of scripture. When Paul was preaching to the, the Greek pagans there in Athens, they had very little knowledge of or respect for scriptures. So for him to say, but the Bible says this and the Bible says that, well, if they don't know about the Bible and they don't know about the authority of the Bible, he had to start somewhere else. So Paul started by pointing to one of the idols they worshiped. He said, look, you've got an idol that you've made to an unknown God. Let me tell you about that God that you worship in ignorance. And so he used that as a bridge to start telling them about Jesus and eventually you bring people into study of the Bible where they depend on the Bible. At Amazing Facts, when people are looking to come to Jesus, we start out by giving them our first Bible study that talks about the validity and the power of Scripture. So it builds their confidence in Scripture. So then you can quote the Bible later on. I see. Okay, I understand. Well, that answers that. We'd be happy to send you our first study in the Bible. It's uh, called Anything Left You Can Trust. I think Pastor Ross just offered that to someone else a moment yes, ago. Yes, the number to call is 800-835-6747. Ask for the study guide called Is There Anything Left You Can Trust? Talking about the Bible and how we can trust the Bible indeed. Our next caller that we have is, looks like Cindy's calling from Minnesota. Cindy, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for calling. My question is, uh, 
I know you don't have to be circumcised to become a Christian, but after you're a Christian, do you need to be circumcised? No. Um, You know, Paul says pretty clearly in uh, Galatians and a number of other places that he says circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing. You can read in Acts chapter 15, and the New Testament church had a pretty lengthy debate wondering whether or not the um, converts to Christianity had to be circumcised, and they came to the conclusion, no, they don't need to be circumcised. Even after they accept Jesus and they're saved, it was not a requirement. Uh, People before the time of Abraham, like Noah and Enoch and Adam, were saved based on the faith in the blood of the Lamb. They were not circumcised. Circumcision was a covenant that was given to the Jewish nation to point them to Jesus, that the holy seed of the Christ was going to come through Abraham to Christ. It also was a symbol for a cutting away of the flesh, meaning you would not be carnally minded, but spiritually minded. And so, um, you know, with the coming of Christ, the ceremonial law passed away, and circumcision was part of that. Paul makes it pretty clear when he says that circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, what matters is uh, keeping the commandments. Okay, that's great. And by the way, that is, that's 1 Corinthians 7.19. Circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments is what matters. Okay, well, that's pretty clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. Appreciate your call. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye-bye. 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 Next caller that we have is calling from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Monty, welcome to the program. Hi, Pastor. Uh, thank you for taking my call. I tried last week, but you had trouble with your phones, I believe. We did. Thanks for calling back. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to know, I know God said uh, when he created everything that it was good each time he created something, and that when the animals went to uh, Noah, he didn't find them. They came to him, and God had to speak to them, I guess, to get them to go on the ark, because lions and tigers would, uh, I gather, wouldn't walk up an ark, you know, onto a ship by themselves. So this is my question. Is there any scripture where an animal was healed or animals were healed in the Bible? Well, let me think about that. There are, uh, there's a scripture where God spoke through an animal. That's the donkey of Balaam. You've got the scripture where two cows were guided by God. These cows were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and they were guided by God from the land of the Philistines back to the land of Israel. You've got the ravens that came and they fed Elijah. And, um, you know, Jesus had several illustrations about the animals, but I don't know of an animal, uh, I don't know of a prophecy where an animal was sick and then was healed. Uh, so I think I'd have to say there's no record of that in the Bible, but you know, the Bible does say a righteous man regards the life of his beast. And even in the Sabbath commandment, it says that you should make sure your beast gets proper rest. Not only were people to rest, they were to let their beasts of burden rest. So that's as close as I think we can come. God certainly cares about animals. He made them. Well, what I thought was that you most of the time you pray for people, God heals who he wants to heal. Some people are healed, some aren't. So I've been praying for a certain animal, and, uh, you know, uh, I know God hears my prayer, and that uh, possibly he would heal this animal. Well, you know what? It is absolutely true that God has the ability to do that. And so... Um... You know, we do have a book that I think we carry. It's called, Will My Pets Be in Heaven? You might enjoy that one. Uh, you know, God can heal animals. I'm sure Pastor Ross would agree with me on that. He answers prayer, and we've all had pets that have gotten sick. Healing is part of the process of all life. You know, God can heal all kinds of animals. Uh, I had a goldfish, I'm ashamed to say, that I thought for sure had died. We had this goldfish for years. I thought it had died. And so uh, I, I, I dumped him in the toilet. I didn't know what else to do. And um, yeah. he came back to life. And I had to wow. reach into the toilet and get him back out again. I, I think there was just not enough oxygen in his fish tank. <laughs> so I'm going to get letters about that. Anyway, he was resurrected with the last place in the world you think he'd be resurrected. 
what, what, what's the name of that book again, Pastor? Uh, Steve Wolberg is the author. It's called Will My Pet Be in Heaven? I know Amazing Facts carries it, and you could probably buy it just online with Amazon. It's not expensive. Will My Pet Be in Heaven? You'll enjoy that, Marty. Thank you so much for your question tonight. Next caller that we have is calling from Hawaii. We have Johnny. Johnny, welcome to the program. Johnny on the line from Hawaii. You still there? Johnny may have his mute on. Hi. Sorry about that. I did have it on. Hey, how would you survive the hurricane? Well, we made it. We expect the worst, but it never came. All right. Well, that's we're thankful for that. It never really, it wasn't, it broke off. It kind of broke off before it reached Oahu, but the big island got real bad. They got it hit pretty hard. And what's your question tonight, Johnny? Yes. Um, I wanted to know, what does the Bible say about spiritual abuse, um, you know, leadership that uh, abuse their authority to bully people around and you know, just um, what does the Bible in general say about? Quite a bit. Now, you won't hear the phrase spiritual abuse, but Jesus talked about wolves in sheep's clothing. Jesus talked about the blind leading the blind. Uh, the Bible talks about um, priests that are dumb dogs that will not bark. They're supposed to warn the people about sin and protect the people. There's quite a few passages in the Bible that talk about people in ministry being faithful, and if they are not, they get a more severe judgment, according to James. So, boy, I, I'll tell you, there's, um, I can't even think of all the different places where God warns his priests and his ministers. You've got the story where the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain by the Lord because of their bad behavior in the sanctuary, uh, as well as Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Eli. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them because they went into the temple drunk. And so you, God gives, you know, Jesus, you read, what is it, Matthew 23, where he talks about the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, that they would put burdens on people they would not lift with one of their fingers. And... Um, that they rob widows' houses and then pray long prayers so they can look spiritual. So, yeah, Jesus said a lot of strong things about false ministers. Yeah, that's Matthew 23, verse 4, which you're referring to. So, yeah, boy, I tell you, Johnny, there's quite a bit there. You just won't find the phrase spiritual abuse, but it's that principle, people abusing their spiritual authority. Thank you again for answering my question. I really appreciate it. God bless you guys. All right, thanks so much. Appreciate your call. Aloha. Well, Pastor Doug, we're looking at the clock. I don't know if we have time to take another call just before we have nope. our break. Can you do the music There's there the in music. the background? <laughs> hey, friends, don't go anywhere. We've got the, some of the best Bible questions are still lined up. Be right back. Stay tuned. Bible Answers Live will return in a moment. Deep within the pages of the Bible stories of great heroes heroes of great deeds great love and great sacrifice but behind them is another hero hidden in plain sight amid the shadows he was there from the beginning and he'll be there until the end Discover the golden thread of a Savior woven throughout the entire Bible tapestry. Shadows of Light. Seeing Jesus in all the Bible. Get your copy today by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Hey, Grandma, I was looking through your mail the other day. You were looking through my what? And I found a way you can save big on your taxes. Now that you are 70 and a half years old, you can make charitable donations to Amazing Facts. An IRA charitable rollover is a win-win for you and the Lord's work. First, it satisfies your minimum distribution. It reduces your taxable income. It is not subject to the 50% deduction limit. And your gift helps Amazing Facts bring people to Jesus. Call Amazing Facts today to see how we can help you get the most out of your IRA. The number to dial is 800-436-2695 or visit mylegacy.amazingfacts.org. 
If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at amazingfacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. Amazingfacts.org. Every Bible question you have answered moves you one step closer to the fullness of God's will for your life. So what are you waiting for? Get the answers you need for a fuller, richer, more confident life. You're listening to Bible Answers Live. This broadcast is a previously recorded episode. If you'd like answers to your Bible-related questions on the air, please call us next Sunday between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Pacific Time. To receive any of the Bible resources mentioned in this evening's program, call 800-835-6747. Once again, that's 800-835-6747. Now, let's join pastors Doug Batchelor and John Ross for more Bible Answers Live. Welcome listening friends. If you've tuned in along the way, this is Bible Answers Live and you can call in with your questions as you just heard. It's 800-GOD-SAYS, 800-463-7297. And I want to welcome our friends who are also watching on the, either YouTube or Facebook at the Amazing Facts channel or the Doug Batchelor channel. And I am Doug Batchelor. My name is John Ross. And Pastor Doug, we're ready to go to the phone lines. Our next caller is Marcus, and he's listening in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Marcus, welcome to the program. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Doing well. Hey, I got a quick question. Well, it may not be as quick, but I think it is. Uh, Revelation 11 talks about the two witnesses and at first i was believing it to be the old and new testament but as far as i'm reading it i'm starting to see something a little bit different uh seeing is that it when it says that it's the olive tree and the lamp stands mm-hmm. that it could be the hebrews and the gentiles which would make up the church who are the witnesses who the beast rises up out of the abyss and kills them. You, you know, you're you're on the right track about it being the word of God, a word of God believed by both Jews and Gentiles. Um, sometimes it's referred to as the law and the prophets, uh, or the new and the old testament. Um, if you look when he talks about an olive tree and a lampstand, that comes from the book of Zechariah. Correct. And the, you know the Bible tells us thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and the um, the Holy Spirit is like the oil that came from the olive trees. And so, and that's Zechariah 4, 2, 3, verse 11 and 14. So all of the symbols about the two witnesses are characteristics of the Word of God. It says that uh, they can shut up the heavens, they can bring plagues. So you find plagues in the Old and the New Testament. You find famine in the Old and the New Testament. And uh, it just... It's a symbol for the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah. You know, the last prophecy in the Old Testament said, remember the law of Moses, behold, I send you Elijah. That represents the law and the prophets, the word of God. You know, I have a book I've written on this. I'd be happy to send you a free copy, Marcus. And it's called The Two Witnesses. All you'll have to do to receive the book is just call us on our resource line. That's 800-835-6747. And ask for the book called The Two Witnesses. It's just a great study dealing with Revelation chapter 11. I'm happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. We've got Roger who is listening from Colorado. Roger, welcome to the program. Thank you for accepting my call. Yeah. I have an interesting question. I've been studying Revelation with a couple other people. Now, they're coming up with a different word for world or earth. And it says the meaning of it is region. Is there a Greek word for world? Well, that depends on what verse. Let me see here. Um, well, yeah, I'm sure there is a Greek word for world. You get, you know, is it tierra? And uh, matter of fact, um, when it talks about the earth, there's also a Greek word for the word earth, and that can mean the ground. Um, Pastor Ross might be looking him up right now from the look on his face. Yes, I'm just looking at a few. Fr- there's quite a few actually in Revelation that talk about the world. And uh, the one that I'm looking at is Revelation chapter 13. It talks about all the world worshiping the beast power. And uh, you also have the word earth used in Scripture as well. 
So when it talks about the world, it's just talking about the inhabitants of the world. And it talks about them worshipping the beast. And when it talks about the earth, it's referring more to the land, so to speak, which in symbol represents a sparsely populated area. You'll notice the second beast of Revelation 13 comes up from the earth, and that's Revelation 13, 11. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think one, one of them where it talks about uh, the whole world to test in uh, Revelation 3.10, it's Alkanaminis, I might be pronouncing that wrong, and it means the inhabited world, a populated a populated place. So mm -hmm. that word, I think, appears a number of times in Greek, and um, it could mean inhabited regions. So that that's on the line with what you were saying. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yes, because I've got somebody telling me that when it talks about the world, it's talking mainly about the region, like the world will see when he returns. And he says, no, it's only going to be that region that pierced him. I said, no, my Bible says the world will see him. Well, you know, another reason you're correct is when it says in Revelation, he comes in the clouds and every eye will see him. Well, that's pretty comprehensive. Every eye is going to see him, and that's talking about the. And a matter of fact, I think it says all the tribes of the earth will mourn. It's Revelation six. So it's not just one country or one region that's going to see it. That's going to affect everybody. Good question, Roger. Thank you. Next caller that we have is uh, Roberta, listening from South Carolina. Roberta, welcome to the program. Roberta. Roberta. Hi. 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 Get real close to your phone. Can you hear me? That's better. Okay. Um, my question is on Acts, let me find it, Acts 23, 8. It says, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Yes. What is the spirit that is being referred to in this text? Well, the... Uh the fair, I'm sorry, the Sadducees were a very liberal sect of the Jews, and they didn't believe in, an angel is a spirit. And so they said, well, we don't believe in angels or other spirits, meaning cherubim, seraphim, uh, these other creatures of God that are invisible to us. The Bible calls them ministering spirits, and they're living, intelligent creatures. Uh, Paul says, you know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against uh, you know, principalities and powers, these are the ministering spirits or the evil spirits in high places. Right, and I think that's also part of the reference that you've got angels on the good side, and then sometimes the fallen angels are referenced as spirits or evil spirits, and I think it's addressing both. It's right. fallen angels as well as good angels. The Sadducees didn't believe in any of that. They didn't even believe in the resurrection. Yeah, they just thought this was it. So the Greek there refers to the same as angels? Well, it's two different words, but the angel is described as a spirit in the Bible, and then evil spirits or fallen angels also reference the spirits. The word spirit there is from the Greek word pneuma, and it's it's used interchangeably with breath. Uh, they used it for spirit, for it could be a presence or a supernatural being. Um, so that's the same word that's used many times um, in the New Testament in the Greek. So it means they didn't believe in any angel or the spiritual world. It means good or bad angels. So the Greek is pneuma. Yeah, the word is pneuma. I'm looking at it right now. Hey, well, we appreciate that. I'm trying to think what we have that would give you more information. Oh, we got, uh, we got a, well, I got a sermon online called Angels. It talks about angels. But uh, we do have a, a lesson that's called Messages from Outer Space. It talks about three angel messages. Yes, and if you'd like to receive that study guide, it's called Angel Messages from Space. The number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the study guide called Angel Messages from Space. Next caller that we have is uh, Andy listening in Fort Worth, Texas. Andy, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you all this evening? Doing good. Thank you for calling, Andy. Well, it's definitely my pleasure. I just want to tell you how much I've enjoyed um, your shows and... Uh, how much it's challenged me to learn more and just thank you for being on uh, the radio this evening. I was really shocked. I was driving home and I heard you and I thought, Oh my gosh, I've wanted to speak to you so many times watching your show. And I have about 10 questions, but I'm going to ask you just <laughs> probably what I think is the most um, difficult one that I'm struggling with. And I would just really appreciate your opinion. Uh, 
I originally called and said I wanted to speak to you about God's will, which I do, but it's the third part of my question. And I also want to tell you how much I enjoyed your personal testimony, which I saw on television, and I, it just really took me back. I really, uh, it's, just, it's really been Im- impressive to me. I, I grew up not really believing in the Bible. I've got a, a master's degree in biology, and uh, I just couldn't see how evolution and the Bible were two that could combine. And then uh, one day, some gentlemen pointed out to me the errors in evolution, and then I began to see the the truth of Genesis, and then the Bible just broke wide open to me. Mm, And now I see all Scripture. I mean, I see it as black and white. You know, it's either all or nothing. And I see all the Scriptures as having to be true. And because of that, this is my question to you. In uh, Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, it talks about the name of Jesus. It says, Every knee shall bow of those on heaven and earth. And it says, And under the earth. And it says that every tongue should confess that Christ, that Jesus is Christ and, and is the Lord and to the glory of God. And then one day in a Bible study, I was sitting there and they put uh, John 640 up. And it says, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who believes and beholds the son and may have eternal life and that I myself will raise him up on the last day. And then I know from Romans ten nine that if you're willing to confess Jesus as Lord, that you would be saved. And I just sit there and I looked at that and I said, well, if all three of these scriptures are true, which I know they are, then I think that the people that are under the earth have an opportunity to be saved. And oh. when I said that, I was just ostracized. You know, people just immediately just slammed me and said, oh, no, no, no. Well, you know, the, the, well, pardon me, Andy, we've probably got to dive in here and, and start formulating an answer for you. Um, go ahead. But you're probably, the, the whole premise is going to be, what does it mean when it says under the earth? Yeah. Now, you're, you're assuming, I think, that it means those under the earth mean people who are dead and buried. Yeah. You know, I think Paul is referring back to uh, a statement about um, God when he when Moses said the truth is not up in heaven that you've got to go get it it's it's not down in in the ocean it's very near to you there's several references about God in heaven above and earth beneath um it's not talking about dead spirits when he says every creature in the heaven above or the earth beneath you know the bible even talks about uh, every creature is going to praise the Lord. There are some creatures that live in the ocean. Uh, is I don't think he's talking about in the graves there because they had another word for that. Just to add a little thing there, Andy, there will be a confession of even, even the wicked. They will finally acknowledge that God is true, that Jesus is Lord, but it's not going to be an acknowledgement or a repented sort of acknowledgement. You'll remember the story when uh, Judas betrayed Jesus, and then suddenly he realized fully what he had done, and he took the money back and he threw it on the floor at the temple, and he said, I've betrayed innocent blood, and he went out and he hung himself. That that was not repenting of what he had done. He just realized the truth came to him that you know, he had betrayed Jesus. So I think at the end of time— even Pharaoh did that. Yeah. At the end of time, even the wicked will recognize that they've been warring against God, and it's true, Jesus is the Lord. So they will acknowledge that. But it's not a a repentant type of confession that the Bible speaks of is necessary for salvation. Do you you believe and preach that that Jesus went to hell, that he died and went to hell and took the keys? And uh, I mean, is that that scripturally accurate? Uh, No. Uh, people read a verse in First Peter. They say that, you know, it talks about th- through which spirit Christ preached to those spirits in prison when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. And everyone thinks, well, pr- spirits in prison, what does that mean? It's just saying it's the same spirit. And what, you've got that verse there. I do. First Peter chapter 3, verse 19. Yeah, it's saying the same spirit that preached in the days of Noah. Remember when God said, my spirit will not strive with man for he is also flesh. Um, that same spirit is the spirit that rose Jesus. 
It's not saying Jesus, when he died on the cross, he went to give a second chance to people who had died from the days of Noah. That's totally contrary to everything the Bible says, where it says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. After a person dies, their destiny is sealed. They don't get a second chance to hear the gospel again. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, a frequently misunderstood verse, and you don't want to build a doctrine on just one verse. You know, we do have a study guide that I think, um, Andy, you'll find very interesting. It's, it's simply called, Are the Dead Really Dead? And it gets into this whole subject, and I think even addresses those verses we're talking about in First Peter. We'll be happy to send that to you for free. All you'll have to do is just give us a call. The number is 800-835-6747, and just ask for the study guide called, Are the Dead Really Dead? And thank you for your call, Andy. Glad we got a chance to talk. God bless. All right. Next caller that we have is Jess, listening from Bakersfield, California. Jess, welcome to the program. Jess in Bakersfield. Yes, Pastor. Yes. Yeah, you might turn your radio down, Jess, so you could get confused. We'll get confused, too. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, question on the um, on the book of Leviticus, chapter 11. Okay. Where it, talks about, where it talks about the unclean animals. Yeah. And it says you'll be unclean until the evening. What exactly does that mean? Well, it's two different things. It, the, you weren't just unclean until the evening if you ate an unclean animal. They, you weren't supposed to eat the unclean animals. If you touch the carcass of an unclean animal, you know, you know, might have a donkey that died and you had to move the donkey's right. dead body or something. Uh, you know, right. just it's basic laws of sanitation and contamination that you weren't supposed to. Uh, we're putting you on mute because we're getting a lot of background noise. You, you weren't supposed to be touching something. As a matter of fact, they had laws that if you had a, a steel pot and you found a dead rat in it, you could wash that and it would be clean. But if it was a clay pot, you had to destroy it because it would sort of permeate the, uh, the clay. Um, and it was all sanitation, really. I think any, according to Levitical law, any bodily omission, you are considered unclean. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're, you know, does does that help, uh, Jess? Uh, yes, yes, definitely. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. God bless. God bless. And I think we've got a study guide that talks about some of the Levitical laws. And um, well, I was thinking about. Death in the Kitchen. <laughs> That's actually a good book. That is. That is. We'll be happy to send that to anyone who calls and asks. Just simply called Death in the Kitchen. Got an intriguing title. The number to call is 800-835-6747. You can ask for the book called Death in the Kitchen. Next caller that we have is David. Uh, David listening, I believe, in um, is that Mississippi. David, welcome to the program. Yeah, in Missouri. Missouri. Okay. Missouri, okay. Yeah, what are you guys doing? And your question uh, my my question is that um, if I'm paying ten percent to the church and I'm seeing the church is not doing they're supposed to do for the preaching the gospel like the playing the money what any reason so it's okay for me give them five percent and the five percent use it like find any organization seeing doing word of God because it's my church a member and God require me to pay ten percent my income. But I can see that the job not been done, so it look look like my money been used for something else. So it's okay for me to use give them five percent, and I take five percent, see whatever those any organization seen doing work of God. So it's okay with that. I I think I understand your question. So if if the, you know the Bible tells us to bring all of the tithe into the storehouse, and if every member says. Well, you know, I don't know that I have confidence in the way that the work is being done with church leadership. I'm going to pick a different way, or I'm going to divide the percentage differently. Uh, you know, the work of God could break down pretty quickly on an international basis if we do that. I think in the Bible about the story where Hannah, even though the Bible says Eli and his, not Eli so much, but the sons of Eli were mismanaging what was happening in the temple, God still blessed Hannah when she brought her son and made an offering of her son. When uh, the widow came to the temple in the days of Jesus and Jesus saw her about to put in her last two mites, Jesus could have said, don't do that. The priests here are corrupt, or most of them anyway, and, um, or just put in one mite and give the other to me. 
You know, Jesus said God was going to bless her for putting in her two mites. God blesses when we give to him. If people, if there are men or women that mismanage the use of the money, they'll have to answer to God for that. But if you're going to a church, you want to be faithful in supporting the church you attend. Otherwise, it's kind of like, you know, you've got a wife and a girlfriend in another city that you're supporting. You, you want to be supporting the church where you're attending and you're getting all the benefits. Hey, thank you. And we do have a study guide that talks about that subject, David. Yes, to receive that study guide, just call and ask. It's called In God We Trust, and it deals with finance and what the Bible says about that and how our offerings and tithe is to be used. The number to call is 800-835-6747, and just ask for the study guide called In God We Trust. We have Faith, who's listening from Texas. Faith, welcome to the program. Faith in Lubbock. Faith, are you on mute? We can't hear you. Faith, going once. We've got uh, John in Washington. John, welcome to the program. John, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for taking my call. I have a question. I believe it's a, a, a Bible verse or part of one that says, If God be for us, who can be against us? And is that in the Bible, and where? <laughs> I think it's in Romans chapter 8. I'm looking it up right now. Um, let me see here. And a context on it, maybe? Yeah, it's in Romans chapter eight thirty one. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I think Paul is talking here in Romans about if if the Lord is forgiving us, if he's justifying us, if you look at the previous verses, he says, Moreover, he whom was predestined, these also he called. Who he called, he justified. Who he justified, these he glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And he that did not spare, here's the next verse. He that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? In other words, Jesus, God has given his son to redeem us. He's made a heavy investment to make it possible for us to be saved. How can man keep us from being saved if God has done so much to save us? Yes, I understand that. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah. And so it is there. It's in, uh, as I said, Romans 8.31. Appreciate your call. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Next caller that we have is uh, Ramona listening from South Carolina. Ramona, welcome to the program. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I got through. Well, we got a couple minutes, so how can we help you tonight? Well, um, I am wondering if this is a Sabbath question. Would would it be breaking the Sabbath for me to? A oh, don't tell us. We got cut off. I think that you still there, Ramona. I'm here. Do you hear me? Yeah. So you're asking, would it be breaking the Sabbath for you to attend a like a, a bar mitzvah or, or a temple service? It's actually a bat mitzvah for a for my niece. Her girl, yeah. On a Saturday morning. Well, in most cases, I would say no. It's a spiritual event. Now, I come from a Jewish background, and you've got different kinds of. It's just like a wedding. You can go to a Christian wedding, and it'd be a sacred service, and then you can go to a wedding that is not so Christian or pretty liberal, and there's a lot of drinking, dancing, people, you know, walking around with uh, underwear on their head. You never know what you're going to see at a wedding when they start to celebrate. So uh, it depends. <laughs> well, the celebration this, the celebration is actually after sundown, so this is a morning service. Well, you know, I'd say by all means, it, it, the bar mitzvah is um, a time to, a bat mitzvah is a time to celebrate a, a spiritual transition for a young lady. And if you could support your family by going, um, what do you think, Pastor Ross? I think it might be a good spiritual event. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, nothing wrong with spending time with family and on the Sabbath. You'll be in a, in a religious uh, house of worship. I'm so happy to hear that because I've been getting uh, just different feedback. I, I uh, my family's half Jewish and half Christian, so and and the half Christian are you know Sabbath keepers. Well, the, the original Sabbath keepers were Jewish. <laughs> That's right. Now, now, what's ironic is most of the people attending this really don't keep the Sabbath. So, 
Right. But it's in a temple that's a Sabbath keeping. Well, you might be able to be a witness there. It, it's, you know, technically there should be a rabbi there and it would be a sacred occasion. He'll be quoting from the Torah. Yeah. And so, you know, hopefully uh, you can be a witness. It's not something that you do. Uh, you know, Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might reach some for Christ. And Paul specifically says to the Jew, I became as a Jew that I might reach the Jews. Amen. So, uh, you know, you'll have to pray. I'm not the Holy Spirit, but uh, I would uh, probably not lose any sleep over that. And I have Jewish family. I've had the same kind of conundrum. So I understand that. I'm delighted to have gotten through and, and you're you know, your wisdom and your opinion, they do count, but, uh, but yes, ultimately it's prayer and, and, you know, seeking the Holy Spirit to prompt me. Amen. You know, and we, we have a new book that we put out. It's talk about keeping the Sabbath holy. How do you keep the Sabbath holy? And it, it does deal with some of these kind of moral crises or dilemmas or uh, quandaries. We say, you know, what, what should we do? And um, uh, we can send you a free copy of that. I would love it. All right. Hey, thank you so much, Ramona. The number to call is 800-835-6747. And Pastor, you mentioned the book. It's Keeping the Sabbath Holy. Keeping the Sabbath Holy. All yeah. right. Just, it's all there in the name. Amazing. In fact, we put it out about a year ago, and we had a lot of orders, but I don't think we ever promoted it because it just it was so popular through the catalog. Okay. But again, uh, we ought to let people know. That number is 800-835-6747. God bless you. You too. And, you know, I'm looking at the clock. It's counting down 14, 13. See that? 12, 10. Hey, listening friends, we'd love to hear from you in another way. If you'd like to just go to the Amazing Facts website, new website, click donate. Keep us on this station. God bless you. Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. We hope you understand your Bible even better than before. Bible Answers Live is produced by Amazing Facts, a faith-based ministry located in Sacramento, California. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation in Eden. Discover God's amazing plan to save His children. This is a story that involves every life on earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Terror attacks, natural disasters, political instability, and global economic meltdown. These are the images people generally associate with the tribulation and the day of the Lord. But did you know the Bible speaks about another day of the Lord just before the great judgment day? Amazingly, imprinted on the very fabric of time itself is a 24-hour period called the Sabbath that was meant to forever be a time of restoration for every human being a day the entire world is largely forgotten. You'll be surprised to learn how this special day of the Lord factors into last day prophecies such as the mark of the beast, the seal of God, and the great final tribulation. It's all contained in this new eye-opening DVD series called The Last Day of Prophecy. To order, call 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. For over 50 years, Amazing Facts has shared the wonderful news of salvation and provided millions of Bible resources to people all over the world. We've built churches in India, proclaimed God's Word in China, and have sent free Bible studies around the globe. Today's program and free resources were made possible by our ministry partners, caring individuals like you. If you've been blessed by Amazing Facts, would you please consider partnering with us to reach others with the Bible truth? Your financial support today will help keep programs like this on the air so the blessings you've received can be shared with others. To find out more about becoming a ministry partner, please visit our website. 
To take advantage of the offers you've heard on this broadcast, call us at 800-835-6747 or visit our website at amazingfacts.org.